Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. Coming up, Rick Hinderer makes a tribute to the classic USMC K-Bar. I get a loaner knife from a new maker, and we take a look at 15 common blade shapes. Yes, 15. I kept going. I was looking through my case. I was like, oh, and there's this, and there's this, and there's this. So we're going to take a look at all of those. Uh, but before we do, you know how we do here. Uh, this is my first opportunity to show off something. Um, in my pocket. Uh, but I do want to say, um, coming up this weekend is the 4th of July. Please go out there and remember why we celebrate our independence from our good friends now across the shock in Great Britain. But this is a great day to remember our country, our freedoms, and, and to remember, even if you have beef, whatever beef you might have with this country, just remember, you can always go somewhere else and live a miserable life. So here we have a wonderful nation. We have our freedoms and we have to protect them. And uh, one way to do so is to collect knives. And uh, so happy 4th of July, everybody. And uh, and also remember knife rights on this weekend. Uh, our good friends over there are, are helping us retain our, our rights and, uh, you know, We'll get to that in a minute, but the ultimate steal is winding is winding up, and we want to get involved with that too. So happy Fourth of July, people! Happy Independence Day. I'm very fond of calling it Independence Day because that's one of the characteristics of being an American that we all appreciate. So pocket check. What am I carrying today? Two classic. Well, one classic American knife and one knife from a new maker. Uh, the first knife is this Super CQC7 from Emerson knives. You might recognize this from the auction we did on Instagram about a year ago, I'd say. And uh, my brother was in a bidding war with someone else, don't remember who it was, and uh, he ended up winning this. This past weekend, I went on a little trip. Uh, I was seeing my brother and my mom and dad and also my, my best friend, from home, just turned 50, so I went to his birthday party. Anyway, hanging out with my brother, he pulled this out, and he's like, Bob, you're more of an Emerson guy than I am, so I think you should have this. So my very generous, very awesome brother gave me this Super CQC7, which was not only a great uh, great act of generosity, um, but it just so happens to fill a, a gaping void in my Emerson um, collection. That is, I don't have a 7. Uh, I've had a regular CQC7, I think that's the B, and uh, then I sold that for some reason, some fever dream pushed me to do so, and then I had a mini, which I gave to um, Jimmy Slash after he gave me a knife, which you're going to see later in the 15 common uh, knife shapes, and uh, so I didn't have a 7, and, and this makes a nice round dozen of, of Emerson knives this CQC7, super CQC7. Thank you, Vito. I muchly appreciate it. Uh, one cool thing about the CQC7 that I love is this chisel grind. Flat on one side, you've got those deep, um, you know, sort of, uh, uh, what do you call it, dramatic um, bevels on that side, just sharp as all day as, as it can get. And, uh, I did have to do my usual sanding down of the clip side so it doesn't saw my pants. Uh, you know, I don't have a huge clothing bill. I do have a huge knife bill, though. So, um, you know, just to keep everything in balance and proportion, I have to sand down that uh, that clip side of the G10 on the Emerson knives. Uh, next, what am I carrying? I'm carrying a fixed blade. It's a new one. I've shown it off a bit uh, recently, but I'm Still in a honeymoon phase with this awesome thing. This is from Ron Steel Designs. Uh, you can find him, Ron Steel Designs, on Instagram. And this is his Prime model. This is the Drop Point Prime. Uh, Tier 1 recently inspired him to do a Clip Point version. I see he's done a, a couple of Bowie versions of this knife, which are also beautiful. It was very hard for me to decide once I... Once I made my mind up to buy one of his knives and, and order one from him, it was very hard for me to decide, do I go with the beautiful clip point he makes or the original Prime? And I decided I'd go for this original Prime 
drop point because it's a very unique blade shape. I think it's a beautiful blade shape and it's unusual for me to opt for a drop point over a, a clip point. Drop points, there are many, many faces to the drop point. As you know, um, I, I mention that frequently here um, and it's rare that I'll go for a drop point, but, but his is so unique and beautiful. I had to go for it. But one thing I did request special is, uh, is that secondary sharpened edge. He had never done it before. He put his uh, mind to the grindstone, if you will, and he came up with this beautiful design. I asked him for um, maroon micarta, linen micarta handles. He put his English on it by kind of splitting it up and putting some G10 spacers in there. Just a beautiful job. Beautiful job. I'm going to up the light one. There we go, just so you can see. Um, so Ron Steele Designs, this is the Prime. Check him out on Instagram and, uh, well, support your local knife maker, uh, if he's local to you anyway. Uh, Ron Steele makes really cool knives and not all of them as aggressive looking as that one. Um, he's got some cool little EDC Tanto blades and Warren Cliff things. You looks like you can pop in your pocket. So definitely check him out. Uh, before we move on I, uh, to the update, I have an update on my off-grid Grizzly, which I've shown off recently. Uh, thank you, Carrie. It was such an awesome knife. Uh, but before we get to that, I just want to mention again the Knife Rights Ultimate Steel uh, fundraiser. It's their annual fundraising event. You know who Knife Rights is. Uh, led up by Doug Ritter, the great and powerful Doug Ritter of the Ritter Griptilian and now the RSK1 by Hogue, well, he and three and five, which I'm going to be checking out soon, the RSK Mark three and five. But anyway, uh, they're doing their annual fundraising event. And really, at any tier of support, you get a knife back, which is so cool. Um, uh, it looks like the Wii's are all gone at the $300 level. Um, and at the $500 level, you can still get the, uh, the uh, 15, the AD 15 from Cold Steel. And uh, look at this, man, a lot of generous people already donating, but uh, I have to urge you, this is the last day of the early bird bonus. And the early bird bonus allows, you know, allows you entry into a category that uh, if you're a winner, uh, you can pick from any number of amazing prizes. Now, when I was at Blade Show 2021, I saw the, the three or four cases of knives donated by not only the top manufacturers and uh, some of your favorite manufacturers, but also uh, custom knife makers. Um, there's firearms, uh, different optics and things. You can you stand to win and choose what you get as a prize. Uh, here, there's some examples here um, from uh, entering in the, in the early bird bonus. So actually, I have to get uh, I have to get on it and and uh, enter. Um, enter the knife junkie podcast uh, in this early bird and if it uh, if we happen to uh, get some awesome prize well it will go to the knife junkie podcast not to me but to the knife junkie podcast so there you have it knife rights check it out go to knife and uh, and check that out and uh, support you know support our rights all right next <coughs> excuse me uh off grid Knives, you know, off grid knives, and I've talked about them a lot here. We've interviewed Kerry Orifice of Off Grid Knives, great guy, uh, man of adventure, it seems, and, and that's where a lot of his designs come from. Um, he designs them in California, they get made by Best Tech or Wee Knives, and they are just outstanding. He recently sent me a couple to check out, a couple of the new designs, and one of them is just so compelling. It's this. It's called the Grizzly. Now, look at this beast. It is a beast when you look at it from this dimension, but like a tropical fish, when you turn it this way, you see how svelte it is and how thin that blade stock is. This is a camp kitchen knife. And man, what a great camp kitchen knife it is. So as I mentioned, we went away this uh, last week and uh, we went to our little mountain retreat and uh, it's it's actually uh, it's pretty, um, you know, it, it is not like you're roughing it there. But we always do have to bring kitchen knives because, uh, you know, we want to cook while we're there. And this was the one knife I usually bundle up a couple of Kai knives and uh, um, 
my favorite Vustov Trident, but this time we just brought this and it was awesome. Now I have to totally, uh, I have to fully admit I did none of the cooking this time. Uh, however, I did a lot of prep as I normally do. I'm, I'm kind of the prep prep cook around here and, uh, you know, especially on vacations or weekends, my wife likes to bust it out and cook. So I did a lot of cutting with this, as did my wife. And man, this is an awesome just kitchen knife. But you can also see how it would be a great around the camp knife. It'd be great for for carving and chopping, you know, light chopping. I don't, I, don't, I you could baton with this, no problem. Uh, the only thing is, is it's so thin, uh, it wouldn't be that efficient. You want something a little wedgier. I said wedgy. You would want something more wedge and cross section for batoning and popping wood in half. But this is kind of a do all camp kitchen knife and it just looks cool doing it. So I just wanted to give a little update. Finally got a chance to use my off grid grizzly and what a great knife it is. And incidentally, it comes in an awesome sheath, really awesome sheath, which is nice to have around uh, if you're going to keep it on the cutting board just pop it in the sheath and uh it doesn't get you know it doesn't it doesn't nip anyone um unintentionally which is which is the only way we cut people in my house unintentionally so there you have it uh coming up we're going to take a look at a new knife by rick hinderer his tribute to the usmc k bar but uh but first Help support the show on Patreon. Uh, you get knife stickers, a mention on the podcast, early access to the Sunday interview show, and these uh, midweek supplemental shows where I get to go on and on about my knives. And uh, you're also entered into monthly knife giveaways. Uh, your support really helps support the show, and, and we appreciate it greatly, Jim and I do. So check us out on Patreon and see what helping us can get you. The quickest way to get there is by going to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. That's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Today's podcast is brought to you in part by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash knife junkie. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Again, that's www.audibletrial.com forward slash knife junkie. I was so excited when I went on to Knife News uh, this past week and saw that Rick Hinderer has done his own uh, fixed blade version, his own tribute to the USMC K bar. I did not see it at his stand at his uh, booth at Blade Show. Uh, it could have been there. I just um, there are there were throngs of people there all the time, and um, I just I missed it if it if it was there, but. Uh, I was so excited. I went to the, his website just to see if if uh, there were any still around, and lo and behold, they were sold out. Not that I, not that I had the spare six hundred bucks to drop on this uh, knife, but what a beautiful tribute to the USMC K bar, the classic fighting utility knife, um, you know, made right here in America and and on the hips of you know countless soldiers and Marines. Um, during World War II and, and since then. So this is his version. It's a 3V full tang version. And if you look closely, you can see it's got, uh, it's got the classic and sort of emblematic fluting going around the uh, handle, the grooves for gription. Uh, but that handle is uh, full tang, unlike the original USMC K-Bar. And it's got micarta, contoured micarta scales, beautifully, beautifully done micarta scales with those grooves. Um, it looks like screwed onto the handle there. And uh, and then it's got a butt cap and guards made of aluminum. Uh, the guards, if you look closely, you can see there, they are also bolted on there. They're aluminum scales uh, that sandwich the, um, the tang there. And then at the pommel, it's a screw-on, um, screw-on aluminum pommel. Now on the original, it's a pommel that's fit on, and then it's pinned through the uh, the cross section of the pommel through the end of the tang. So this is different. It's screwed on there. Um, these are some of the differences, but oh, that's a beautiful view. Thank you, Jim. But uh, you'll notice it is such a 
high fidelity sort of updating of the knife. He actually went, he meaning Rick Hinderer actually went to K-Bar and asked if he could use their moniker on the blade. And this is the first time that uh, K-Bar has ever allowed the term uh, and the use of that name K-Bar on another knife. And uh, man, that is, if, if that is not an endorsement, I don't know what is. But if you look at this, the blade is, it's such a beautiful version of that, of that classic clip point blade. And not for nothing with that addition of the finger choil there, just north of the, um, of the front finger guard, just uh, I don't know, man. It it is a beautiful addition to that blade shape. I just think it makes it look even even cooler. But you can also tell how uh, it would add some serious serious utility um, right there. Just having that up front again. Three V, which is a great uh, steel for outdoor knives because of its toughness and uh, edge retention. I just think this thing looks classic. It also comes in a beautiful uh, leather sheath that looks very much like the original USMC K-Bar. And instead of having the the um, the Eagle Globe and Anchor, it has the Rekinderer horse with its mane running free as it runs on the step. I guess it's on the plane because it's American. Uh, so definitely check that out. Keep your eye. I'm not sure if they're coming out with more. Uh, they sold out. Uh, I'm sure we have a couple of friends of the show who may have gotten it. I'm thinking of one in particular that comes to Thursday Night Knives quite a bit. Brant, you know who I'm talking about. Uh, hopefully he has one. I'd like to see it virtually up close. Um, someday maybe I'll come into my own uh, tribute knife to the USMC K-Bar made by Rick Hinderer. But in the meantime, pictures will have to suffice. Uh, coming up, we have the state of the collection, and we also have 15 common blade shapes, which I am very excited to look at. Uh, but first, uh, please like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you know each time we upload a video. And check us out tomorrow night, Thursday Night Knives. It is like, it's like a vacation in the middle of the week for me. I love Thursday Night Knives. It's our weekly live stream where you have the opportunity to join us and join our always fascinating conversation. All you have to do is go to thenifejunkie.com slash join, and you can just aim your phone at you, get some light on you. Headphones always help, and uh, and join the conversation. And uh, We'll talk. We can even debate. If you stay till the end of the show, we have a knife fight at the end. That's a, a debate. Anyway, that's Thursday Night Knives right here on YouTube, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, every Thursday night. That's Thursday Night Knives. Do you carry multiple knives, then overthink which one to use when an actual cutting chore pops up? You're a knife junkie of the first order. So good friend of the show, Mike Emler. You know him as, perhaps you know him as Crazy Sharp on Instagram and YouTube. Uh, he first made his bones as a sharpener, and he's also a knife designer and knife maker. He recently did the Sea Snake with Artisan, such a cool fixed blade, uh, small pocketable or neck knife, uh, the Sea Snake. Well, he reached out to me and um, wanted to send me this really cool knife, and he did, and I want to show it off because that's what we do here. Uh, he has made this beautiful Kiridashi and, uh, and the sheath, oh goodness gracious, uh, made by someone else and... Uh, I left the note over there. I can't remember who did that, but I will I will let you know who who made the sheath. It, it is a great sheath. But let us check out this amazing Kiridashi from Mike Emler. Look at this. So it is a chisel ground blade. You can see it's acid stone washed, and it's got this really nice um, rock patterning on it. But... I mentioned up front, his company is called Crazy Sharp, and wow, does this live up to the name Crazy Sharp. Uh, so chisel-edged blades are commonly very, very sharp. This one is just sticky, sticky sharp. I don't know if you know what I mean when I say that, but you know, just in testing the blade by running my thumb across, it, it like takes off a layer of fingerprint. So he sent this to me to check out, and I am so pleased with this thing. It's a perfect utility knife. Oh, excuse me. 
Got a little coffee there. It's a perfect utility knife. Fits the hand ergonomically wonderfully and is small and pocketable. You know, uh, fixed blade knives, a lot of people have trouble carrying them because um, maybe it's not socially acceptable or they can't carry them at their job or um, maybe to them, a, a fixed blade knife in the waistband is not comfortable. Well, this and a lot of people also don't like neck knives. They don't like things hanging around their necks. I understand that. I'm not one of those people, but I totally get it. This thing pops beautifully in the pocket, even with this gorgeous sheath um, made by that company. I just can't remember, but I will I will let you know on the, on the close-up video. But look at that grind. Beautifully ground and no doubt hand-finished, um, uh, that, that primary cutting edge. Mike Emler does all of his sharpening, <clears throat> excuse me, all of his sharpening on stones. I had him redo, reprofile my, um, my Spyderco um, Spidey Chef, had him put a clip on the top and sharpen it. That was one of those blades. Every once in a while, you come across a blade that you just can't get sharp enough. Well, he took that thing and made it a razor blade. And how he does it is just with a stone freehand. And, and I do this I'm not generalizing. He he really does this sort of thing. This is how he shows himself doing it. Instead of kind of going straight across, like you see a lot of people do it, he he has this sort of ancient Japanese technique that he learned while living in Japan, and uh, he just he just does some some crazy work. Uh, <clears throat> so it's no doubt he it's no wonder he made a kiridashi, a traditional Japanese utility blade. I'm trying to show you how sharp it is just by putting it on the edge like that. Oh, thank you, Mike Emler. This is such a cool, cool blade. Um, so I'm going to keep it on me for, for a while and just be cutting stuff with it. Um, you know what? I failed to ask him what, what blade steel this is. Something tells me it's 3V. I, I seem to remember that's what he said, uh, but I'm going to have to find out. And uh, like I said, on the close-up video I end up doing of this, I will let you know uh, the blade steel, and also who made this awesome, awesome sheath. Um, I'll show it off real quick. I like the uh, the little red grommet as a uh, a little accent, little signature mark. Fits in there perfectly. And then you have this little IBW strap, IWB strap, waistband, uh, that fits over there as a lock just to keep it in there. Um, also, it hangs very nicely from these two grommets. Hangs straight, and you can just... Flip it with your thumb and draw it like that. So very cool knife. I know he's made more than this one, and uh, I'm sure he's going to be bringing these to market if he hasn't already. So check these out. Uh, he is crazy sharp. Mike Emler, crazy sharp on uh, Instagram. Check him out. Next is another sort of Kiridashi, I guess you could call it, uh, but a bigger, meaner one. This is the Ronin from Spyderco. Finally got me a Ronin from Spyderco. You know me, I love uh, the Yojimbo 2 and the Yojumbo, and uh, I'm going to do a little name dropping here. And, and this is name dropping that only works with knife dudes uh, but uh, and gals. I was at uh, In the Pit. I was in the pit at Blade Show, man. And uh, I talked with uh, Mike, uh, Michael Janich. I saw him and I, I um, you know, I've interviewed him a couple of times. He's been on he was on a uh, town hall and we interviewed him here on the show. So I had to introduce myself in person and we had a great chat. We were just talking, blah, blah, blah. It was, it was awesome. Just talking to Michael Janich about fighting knife designs and this and that. And I told him I had never um, experienced the Ronin. I still hadn't gotten it. And uh, so he had one sent to me. Thank you, Michael Janich. How cool. Um, and so here it is. Uh, and as a daily carrier of fixed blade knives, the Ronin is awesome. I didn't realize this, but it is super thin. Super thin. This is BD1, CTS BD1 steel, uh, hollow ground. It's a thin, thin-ish blade stock that is broad and then is hollow ground. So behind the edge, it's like barely there. It's like a laser beam there. Very, very thin behind the edge. Very slicey, pointy knife. Um, but the great part about, another great part about it is how thin these G10 handle slabs are. This just makes it so much easier to carry. Uh, I carry it on the waistband. Uh, I mean, yeah, in the waistband 
at uh, about the three o'clock position on my right hip with the edge facing forward so that when you grab it, you grab it in, in this uh, tip down position, tip down edge out position. And it really, really melts into, <laughs> into the love handle. What can I say? It's barely there and it, it's, it's great. So I'm, I'm really, really excited about this knife. Uh, I'm going to be doing a close-up video on this, also comparing it to the Yojumbo, the Yojimbo, and several other uh, fixed blade um, everyday carry knives that I that I possess and carry on a regular basis. I'm really thrilled about this knife. Uh, one thing that that mm, raises my eyebrow is the broadness, just the the size of the of the sheath. Now it fits very well in the sheath. Um, and it's a, it is a great sheath. It's just a little bit big. So actually I might trim a little all the way around, take this to my grinder. You see, they left a bit of material and thin it out that way, uh, just by removing some of this, uh, excess plastic here. I also might make myself a taco sheath. I like, I like a taco style sheath. That means it's folded over and you only have grommets on one side and get a, uh, I might get a utility clip or I'm sorry, Ulti Clip. Um, I've, I've been liking those recently and uh, make this all my own. But man, thank you, Michael. And thank you, Spyderco, for making such cool knives. But especially this Yojimbo Yojumbo series, uh, Ronin. Uh, I, I just love it. I love the straight edge and the pointiness. Um, and it is a it is basically a Kiridashi, just, just tooled for, for battle. All right, next, uh, speaking of... Um, well, everyday carry fixed blades, uh, uh, a maker reached out to me and sent me this beautiful knife. His name is Marcus Williamson. He goes by MW Steelworks on Instagram, and that is his company name. And, uh, he's out of uh, South Carolina and he posted this on Instagram and then sent it to me to check out. And what a beautiful, beautiful little knife this is. This model is called the Merlin. And as you can see, it's a little sheep's foot blade that pops in your pocket in this nice little leather leather sheath. Uh, it is one, two, so it is a two and a half inch blade, and it's got beautiful Mexican bocote wood there. I think that's how you pronounce it. I I was convincing the way I said it. And then he's got three layers of G10. Is that two? No, it's two layers of G10. One of them is multicolored. Um, as liners there, which is just so handsome. And then the pins are, they look like micarta pins. Um, so I'm going to carry this. He loaned this to me for a few weeks. Um, he said I could take my time with it and use it on all sorts of stuff. And um, I will carry it and I will keep it for a few weeks. But, you know, they say uh, possession is nine tenths of the law. And the longer this thing stays with me, the more I will grow attached. And uh, who, who knows, maybe this is his sales technique. Get it in my hands and he'll know I won't be able to resist, something like that. But uh, what a gorgeous little knife. And he's been uh, burning it up. I've been uh, following him on Instagram and he's got a lot of other models, uh, larger, uh, some kind of hunting, some sort of just utility EDC uh, blades, just, just beautiful work. So check him out. That's MW Steelworks. And this is the Merlin. Look at that. Very, very nice work. Nice work, sir. Thank you for uh, loaning this to me. I really appreciate it. And uh, so uh, my state of the collection this week, I just realized, are all straight bladed knives. I'm going to put these down real quick, and then I'm going to move on to our main topic. But look at this. I, I'm Coincidence? I don't know. Do I believe in coincidence? I don't know. Look at that. Those are cool. I could just sit here and stare at them all day, but I'm not going to do that because we have listeners too. All right. So I want to get to this topic of blade shapes. You know, this is something Jim has been um, kind of uh, suggesting I do because uh, I've had a number of shows where I just get into, oh, these are my, these are the uh, Bowies in my collection. These are the Tantos in my collection. Well, coming up next week, I think I'm going to do a whole show on drop points because it's like the 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 
it's the big dustbin of blade shape concepts. You know, everything is a modifi modified drop point. So I'm going to show you a number of drop points in my collection next week. I think I'm going to do that. Now that I've said it, I, I have to do it. But this week, I just want to I just want to do sort of a survey of blade shapes. I, I I I thought I would be struggling to get ten, and then in going through my collection, I. I came up with 15, 15 common blade shapes. Um, each one of these has a number of different variations. Uh, and I'm not going to show all the different types of variations, but I might, I might mention them here and there uh, because we could be here all week talking about the variations of the Bowie and the variations of the Tanto, that kind of thing. Speaking of Bowie, let's start there. <clears throat> and these are almost all folding knives, almost all. So first is the Bowie or clip point, uh, which is signified by this shape here. I'm, I'm showing this hinderer because it dramatically illustrates the clip. That's this part here. It's as if you took and you clipped out a piece of the top of the blade here. And oftentimes it's curved. Many times it's straight. That's what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm not going to show you every variation, but this is the Bowie clip point the Bowie or clip point blade. And uh, to me, um, Hinderer, Rick Hinderer just does the probably to me the best looking Bowie shaped blade. I love that giant long clip here. And uh, originally on, on the big Bowie knives, the fixed blade Bowie knives, this is sharpened either, you know, either to a, to a fine edge, but usually not. It's more of a wedge shaped zero ground. Um, edge that you can use in a flicking sort of, uh, here, I'll show it here, in this sort of flicking backward motion, say you're fighting someone, you know, with a knife, and they're stabbing at you, straight thrusting, an angle five, you just take your, your knife and you flick it down this way on the top of their arm, on their forearm, on their bicep or what, if you, if it's their bicep, their blade is already in your gut, so hopefully it's on the back of the hand or something like that, and, and this clip point with the wedge there uh, gouges and tears. And uh, so it's a it's a part of the blade that is sometimes sharp, sometimes most often these days not. But it's it's there as a, uh, you know, they used to say the Bowie blade cuts both ways. Um, so that that. Uh, well, that's what that clip is for originally. And that's that's the part that I, I like about it. Um, so anyway, an elegant, beautiful blade shape is the Bowie and the variations are, are many, but I figured I would show off this uh, hinderer. All right, I'm gonna place this down here and we're gonna move on to the Tanto. Now with the Tanto, some people call it Tanto. I don't know, when I say Tanto, it reminds me of, uh, you know, uh, American Indian, uh, Native American stuff. So I, don't, I just say Tanto. In my mind, that sounds more Japanese. Is that accurate? I'm not sure. Uh, but Really, they break down into two camps. Um, the American Tanto, which was uh, kind of how we were all introduced to it through Cold Steel um, way back in the 80s. And, and then the more traditional Tanto. So I, this is a case where I'm going to show you a variation on each. I'm not going to show you the Cold Steel, though. I'm going to show you this, uh, the Riot K1. I'm sorry, the Riot K2. When we talk about an American Tanto, we're talking about uh, a straight edge blade for the, for most of the length that comes to a secondary point right here, and then curves upward or or just angles upward straight. Sometimes it's straight, like on the cold steel Tantos. On this one, it curves here for this front portion, and oftentimes uh, this straight, the long straight length is hollow ground, and then this forward chiseled portion is flat ground. I'm showing this one because it's a very dramatic um, sort of illustration. Let me turn this down a little bit so it doesn't. So it's a very dramatic illustration of that concept. So to me, this is one of the most beautiful tantos anywhere. I, I just love Riot knives. I love this design and uh, I love the way they, um, they, they do their machine satin. Apparently, it's all done by hand. 
and what I mean by that is that like it's done on the machine, but someone is holding it. It's not like running through some automated process. Uh, so there's the Americanized Tanto. And then here is a version or an example of more of a traditional uh, Tanto. This is the CRKT Obaki. And um, sometimes this is called a Quaken. A Quaken is a, is a traditional Tanto that's in a, it's mounted in a, a non ornate or a non, uh, uh, an un, un, uh, decorated. That's not the term. What am I looking Unornamented, I guess, uh, mount. And, uh, so, but, but really the important part is this is the blade is that it swoops up and it, it comes up to the tip without making that abrupt angle change and creating a secondary point. I know I'm going to have all sorts of Japanese knife nerds coming down on me, but that's basically the difference. The Americanized Tanto has the secondary point here and the very uh, um, dramatic and pronounced sort of chisel tip. And the traditional Japanese Tanto has more of a gradual and graceful curve up to that tip. Either way, you don't want to be on the business end of the Tanto. And uh, I'm going to leave it right there. This is going to be, this is going to fill up this cutting board right quick. Okay. So we're talking Tanto. Now I cannot, you know, I don't, I don't condone this next blade shape, at least in the naming of it, but I can't just pretend it doesn't exist because this is how manufacturers, this is how makers um, refer to this shape blade. So this is a, I'm going to put it in, in, in quotes. This is a reverse Tanto. <laughs> you know, I like to call it a worn cliff with a belly, but really this is uh this is what people call a reverse tanto because if you look at it and in reverse it it it's very much like a tanto except the sharp part on a traditional americanized tanto is the dull part, the spine. Um very very useful blade shape. I love this blade shape and I love this knife. This is the uh this is the new Off-Grid Knives Enforcer XL. I like the name too. Not for nothing, this is like probably one of the smoothest knives I have. It's a four inch blade, so it, it falls into the handle. But really we're talking about blade shapes here. Very utilitarian blade shape. This is a great do-all blade shape because uh, you've got a little bit of a curve. You know, I'm also thinking the, the, um, the Benchmade 940 is probably the most famous reverse Tanto. I'm saying it slowly because if you can't see me, I'm air quoting. Uh, because it's got just a little bit of belly and it's got a tip. It's got a an extreme clip. You might even call this a clip point, but, you know, it's got an extreme clip and a very workable uh, utilitarian tip there. So here we have the reverse Tanto. <sighs> Uh, you you can see I'm just sort of surrendering to it. I'm I'm sort of I'm just sort of caving to it. But reverse tanto, uh, great blade shape, and uh, you might want to call it a Warren Cliff with with a belly. So we're gonna put that there. That is the Enforcer XL uh, by Off Grid Knives. Uh, the next one is also an Off Grid Knives knife, and it is a blade shape that you see, I think you see it more frequently on uh, traditional slip joint style knives. And that is the sheep's foot. And this differs from the Warren Cliff. I will tell you how. This uh, has the sheep's foot blade has a straight edge, straight cutting edge, as you can see here. And then from the spine to the tip has a nice curving drop. Oftentimes it doesn't have even this much of a point. Oftentimes you'll see it uh, come even more um, precipitously towards the edge, leaving uh, less of a tip for for you know thrusting or penetrating. This this uh, a, an, an, a traditional sheep's foot would have more trouble than this. Let me put it that way. Getting into like a hard clamshell package or something like this. Uh, so the shape of this sheep's foot allows for for a bit of that point to puncture. But uh, the point is that a sheep's foot has this curve here. So from the spine down to the uh, cutting edge is a curve, a downward curve, which differs from the next knife. I'm going to put this here. 
great utility knife, by the way. I've used this in a lot of uh, um, uh, craft chores with my daughter, cutting on paper on this very mat. This thing does great if you're cutting out shapes and stuff instead of an X-Acto knife. Who needs an X-Acto knife when you can have an off-grid black stallion? So this, you'll see, this is the sheep's foot differs from the Warncliffe in this way. So this is a Hinderer XM24 Warncliffe. I think probably the prettiest Warncliffe out there. Um, but it differs in that the Warncliffe has a straight edge coming to that point, coming from the spine down to the cutting edge. It has an angled straight edge, which terminates in quite a nice point. So that's your difference there between the Warncliffe and the sheep's foot. The sheep's foot has the rounded spine Going down to the cutting edge, the Warncliffe has that straight, straight edge on an angle, uh, ending in a sort of point there. Oftentimes, to me, I think of it like a sax knife, the traditional uh, sax uh, that we think of the Vikings having or the you know er earlier Europeans having. Though oftentimes those blades had uh, a bit of a slight belly or a curve. Uh, the Warncliffe, as we know it, as we think about it, has a straight edge. Straight edge, nice point, and uh, a, um, a, a straight spine leading to that edge. So you can see these three lined up. The They're all kind of similar. The reverse tanto, quote-unquote, the, um, the sheep's foot and the Warncliffe, kind of all stable mates, if you ask me. Um, my favorite of these three, I, I would have to say, is the Warren Cliff. I love that Warren Cliff shape. All right, next. Now we get into the nebulous territory of the drop point. Uh, I have a lot of drop points in my collection, as does everyone. You could have a collection of five knives and you'd have a lot of drop points because if you put the word modified in front of it, pretty much everything is a modified drop point. Um, but I'm going to go with what to me is really... Um, an obvious drop point here. So I mentioned Jimmy Slash earlier. This is a knife he gave me. This is the Formax uh, designed by Andrew Demko and produced by Cold Steel. This is the Formax Scout. That is a classic drop point blade. So you just, you have a curved edge uh, with some straight, usually with some straight here, uh, a straight portion and then a belly that curves upward and then you have the spine, which comes and curves and drops down towards the tip. Classic drop point here. Um, I was kind of going back and forth as to whether to show uh, whether to lump two blade shapes together, the recurve and the drop point. I have a lot of drop point, recurved drop points, uh, but I decided I would kind of break them out into separate uh, separate knives. So this here is uh, probably. <clears throat> Excuse me, my my voice just cracked. You can tell how uh, I'm Benjamin buttoning. Uh, so this is probably the most universal and useful blade shape of them all. Um, I, I I don't even know why I'm saying that. That that's totally subjective. I, I look at this and I think, well, why why is it more useful than the clip point? And the only thing that comes to mind is that say you have to baton this blade shape, and I'm not necessarily saying this folding blade shape, but because of that curve and because of the, um, the sort of gentle nature, the gentle profile of the spine, you could use this with a baton and not chew up your baton like you might with the upward curve of the clip on a clip point. And that's, you know, that's just getting way in the weeds and being maybe just too nerdy even for this show about it but uh to me the drop point is the most generic blade shape and hence kind of the most useful let's let's start an argument about that shall we okay next is a uh, this is a combination this example is a combination but i really wanted to illustrate a recurve i have a lot of great recurves it's a shape i love and um it's a feature a cutting feature i love um, not just for utility, but also in the in the weapons aspect of it, because it reminds me of a, a lot of these knives behind me, these Filipino knives um, that that recurve. But I'm showing it to you on this uh, MK Ultra, designed by 
uh, Jason Knight. And this is a kukri also, so you, you're kind of getting a twofer here. Uh, but the, the thing that the kukri is really good at showing is that recurve. Recurve is when you have this sort of S shape to the blade. The idea behind the recurve is, uh, let's pretend we're not chopping for a second here. Uh, this being a kukri, you think of a chopping motion, but think of a dragging motion. You're pulling it across something that you're cutting. You, uh, it's this first curve going into this belly that really accelerates the cut. Um, it pulls material into this shape, and, and as you pull it through, it accelerates that cut with that downward shape, with the downward angle of that shape. So the recurve, one of my favorite blade shapes, even though it's kind of a, um, it's more of an edge profile, than an overall shape because recurves kind of like the drop point can take on many different uh, shapes. This one, this one is a perfect example of that recurve. So instead of having a drop point recurve, which I have many of, I decided I would show you that uh, in the sort of the kukri form. Next we have the spear point. The spear point, as illustrated by the Cristal Aurora and Ivan Braganet's design, uh, imported by Levon of the Knife Nuts podcast. He's been doing these, this, uh, this um, import business. Anyway, a spear point has, if you, if you put a line right down the middle of the blade, it's symmetrical on both sides. Now, you look at this, you might be thrown off by this giant fuller in the center, which is asymmetrical but the blade itself is symmetrical. And uh, spear point blades are great for thrusting and for penetration uh, into, you know, whatever you're, 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 you're thrusting into. But generally, uh, oftentimes they have a, a, media, a medial ridge and are oftentimes single edged. Um, and then we'll get to a variation on that in a second. But, uh, the spear point blade is often found also on uh, traditional knives and often with more belly than this. But this one really looks like a spearhead. So I figured this would be a great example. If you look at it, uh, if you hold it up to the sky and lose the surface details of that fuller, you see how this is a symmetrical blade, uh, making this a spear point, which is a very, very useful blade, especially if you're trying to poke into something like clamshell package again. That's that's my that's my general example. So that's the spear point. Now, I mentioned that most spear points are single-edged. Well, a spear point that's double-edged is a dagger. So I'm going to show it with this. Uh, I'll illustrate that with this Arcane Designs antimatter. Beautiful symmetrical knife all the way. But that's... That is really what makes a dagger. A dagger is the perfect symmetry. Uh, oftentimes, uh, these days, for selling knives across a, a broader region, you'll see that they're single-edged, like the new Nightstick from Spyderco, which I still don't like the name of um, because it's a very sharp and pointy knife, but it's named after a more blunt uh, object. It is perfectly symmetrical. Um, now you can get double-edged blades, like I showed this one earlier, that are not symmetrical. Um, that just because it's got two edges does not make it a dagger. What makes it a dagger is that symmetrical spear shape, spear point shape, uh, but with the with the double edges. So I said I wasn't going to do too many variations on uh, on themes here, uh, but I, I figured I'd show the uh, I'd show the difference between a dagger and a spear point. Uh, and the dagger really helps to illustrate that spear point shape in its perfect symmetry. All right, I'm going to set this one down. I'm running out of space here, so I, I might have to stack them. Remember knife stacking? Is anyone here old enough or into knives enough to remember knife stacking? One of the goofiest trends in online knifery. Uh, if you don't remember that, let me know, and uh, I'll, I'll point you in the direction of some classic knife stackers. Okay, so next we have the uh, the leaf-shaped blade. Leaf-shaped blade. And I'm going to illustrate that with the Kaiser Roach. Now, 
you could really say Spyderco has a lot of leaf shaped blades and they do. I just don't happen to have any of them. Uh, like the Manix, uh, I don't have that anymore or the Shaman. That's a, that's a classic leaf shaped blade, but this is as well. And, uh, you know, you can, you can tell why it's named that it is, looks like a leaf. This also looks a bit like a spear point, except, uh, when you look at the grind, the grind is a flat grind comes up very high. It's almost, well, it's like three quarters, uh, flat grind. So to me, it is not a spear point because it does not have, uh, it's not, it's not that symmetrical, um, when you look at it, uh, because of the height of that grind. Am I splitting hairs? Am I splitting leaves? I don't know. But a leaf-shaped blade is a very, very useful blade. Usually it has a continual belly, no straight, and the top also is a drop point. So it'll drop in a, in a sort of a severe curve from the top, and it will rise in sort of a severe belly curve to that tip. Uh, and like I said, you can see that a lot in many of the Spyderco knives out there. This, I'm showing it on the Kaiser Roach. Okay, next. This is one of the few uh, fixed blades in this, in this because uh, I don't have any folding versions of it. But this is a cleaver. This is something that has been uh, very um, de rigueur the past couple of years. Uh, people love them some cleavers. This is a newish one from Off Grid Knives called the Hoglet. Great little name. It's a great little utility knife. Um, and, uh, you know, cleavers from the kitchen oftentimes drop straight from the front uh, of the spine to the tip. This one has a nice uh, angle there, which allows you to have a tip. So you can penetrate into things like clamshell packages or whatever else you have to. Uh, let's say, let's use a different example. Uh, a bag of horse feed. How's that? That that sounds like a little more folksy. Sounds like I'm a little more outdoorsy. Uh, but you can cut into more things with that point, which makes it less of a vegetable cleaver and more of a utility knife. But I like this tip of the hat to the classic cleaver. He put, uh, Carrie designed in a hole up front. That hole on a traditional cleaver is how you would hang it, you know, on your on your uh, rack of kitchen implements and and such. Um, cleaver can have a straight edge or a curved edge. Uh, I think that in in the in the um, in the case of the cleaver, I like the curved edge a little better. Uh, and the reason I say that is because the tip is always going to be a little less pronounced, even with this uh, angled straight. Uh, portion here. So the curve gives you just a little bit uh, more cutting capability, in my opinion. So that is the cleaver, cleaver style blade. So we've gone Bowie, Tanto, Reverse Tanto, Sheep's Foot, Warncliffe, Drop Point, Recurve, Spear Point, Dagger, Leaf, Cleaver, and we've got four more. This one is the craziest, most extreme, but a classic. This is not, this is not something that's just out there for marketing purposes. And that is the Chris. The Chris is like a, you can see it's a wavy shaped blade, um, but it's like a multi recurve. It's like recurve, re recurve, recurve, recurve. So found a lot in Malaysian blades, Filipino blades. Uh, these are fighting, um, you know, grievous bodily harm style blades uh, that uh, as you thrust it into your enemy, those waves saw into the person a bit like a like an undulating bread knife. And uh, also on a slash, you get, like I mentioned, three recurves and then this hawk, this downturned hawk bill clip uh, tip that just tears and gouges. So this is a no joke blade shape. Uh, I think I think when Cold Steel started doing the crisp, people were like, just kind of thought, oh, well, this is just Cold Steel trying to be different and trying to uh, show off their chops with grinding. And by the way, they did a beautiful job grinding all three of the Chris's I have by them. And that's not an easy blade shape to grind or to put an edge on. They did a great job. But as a blade shape, uh, definitely a very, very useful uh, blade shape. If you're going to be fighting with a knife, let's just call a spade a spade. So I'm going to put that crisp blade down there. The recurve Zilla, you might want to call it. 
or not. Next is the Persian blade. And this is a Spyderco Persian. This is from their eth ethnic series uh, designed by, um, I'm sorry, what's his name? Ed Shemp. Ed Shemp. That's right. I got I to gotta be totally honest. Uh, I have massive respect for Ed Shemp, but he has designed some awkward looking knives, I got to say, especially his Bowie that, that he made for Spyderco. Uh, but we're not talking about the Bowie. We're talking about the Persian. And a Persian style blade has this upward sweeping leading edge or leading tip. So this is a perfect example. You look at this, you look at the spine of the blade, it curves upward from, from, the, uh, uh, from the tang, from the ricasso, curves upward and then the edge sweeps up with it. Uh, this, this creates a massive shearing curve. Uh, that that is uh, they call these Persian blades because they're based on the shamshir or the or the um, scimitar or you know the kind of blades we think of in the Arabian Nights you know the big long curved upward curving blades sabers you know they were adapted for horse riding uh, you ride by someone with this big giant curved blade and you take a swipe at them it's very very effective. So we've seen this on a number of EDC style folding blades like the, like the, um, well, like this Spyderco Persian, like the cold steel, uh, the cold steel that they're bringing back, which suddenly escapes my, my mind. I can't remember the name of it, but I want one. <laughs> uh, how's that work for you? What do they call that? They call that, the, no, it's not the sham shear, it's the, well, Write in the comments below. What am I forgetting? What is the name of the cold steel that I'm forgetting that they're bringing back in the five and a half inch version? We've all been asking for it. And for some reason, just escapes my mind. Okay, two more blade shapes, and they are definitely relatives. The first uh, is illustrated by this piece arc by Emerson Knives, and that's the hawk bill. And you can see it looks like a hawk's bill. So the cutting edge is curved downward toward a sharp tip. And the spine does the same, come up, kind of mimics the same shape, but at a different angle. And this is an excellent blade shape for draw cutting. Uh, they put it on this police, Peace Arc stands for Police uh, Survival and Rescue Knife. And uh, sometimes uh, you can get the Sark from them and they blunt the tip. But basically the idea is you can put this under a seat belt or anything like that. You can put it in front of rope in this uh, reverse grip like this and pull back on it. And it traps the material within this curved cutting surface. And in doing so, you get uh, accelerated cutting and, and, you know, just higher cutting performance. Also, if you're going to use it and take a swipe at someone with it, you know, like uh, in a slashing motion, say if you were defending your life with it, uh, that downward facing tip um, penetrates kind of like a stab, and then it and then it uh, leads into that curved shearing surface there, or not shearing, but uh, well, yeah, I guess it's a shearing surface. Uh, so that the downward facing tip adds a bit of a stab to the slash, and then that curve traps material in there, somewhat like a recurve, and accelerates the cutting. So that is the hawk bill, and then the last one. Again, this is kind of a variation on the hawk bill but it's different in how it's presented. And that is the fruit knife or the Pical style blade. Now what makes it, you can see it's curved. It's got that extreme curve, kind of like a karambit, kind of like a hawkbill, but it's presented it in a different way. You're supposed to carry this with the tip down and the edge in. So this becomes less of a swiping, less of a slashing knife that you would get from a hawkbill and less of a draw, pull cut, draw cut knife if you're using the Hawkbill for utility. And this is more of a gross motor, uh, gross motor movement um, stabbing implement. Um, this has been popularized by uh, Ed Calderon, Ed's Manifesto, Libra Fighting System, um, where it's, it's uh, angled out like that, tipped down with that curve in, and it, uh, it uh, capitalizes on the larger arcing motions of your elbow and shoulder uh, when you're in a scrape 
and your adrenaline is running and you don't ha have the fine motor skills to do all these fancy knife techniques that you learned in your collie class. Um, and you can just, whoop, and you can just kind of muster this kind of motion that accelerates, uh, that really benefits capitalizes off of that. So these are the 15 blade shapes that I could, um, come up with from my, um, from my collection. Now, if you have other blade shapes, let me know what they are, but not if they're variations on these. Um, for instance, spear point and dagger, they're kind of the same thing, except, you know, in profile, they're kind of the same thing. Uh, but in, but when you really break it down, they are very different. So I don't, uh, yes, there are recurved tantos. I didn't mention those here. There are combinations of all of these things. There's even clip pointed tantos, which is a very attractive and beautiful shape. But let me know if I missed anything uh, large here. And uh, let's let this uh, be the start of our compendium of common blade shapes. I'm going to run down them real quickly before we sign out. We had the Bowie clip point. We had the Tanto, American and traditional. We have the reverse Tanto in air quotes, the sheep's foot, the worn cliff, the drop point, and it's many, many faces. The recurve, the spear point, the dagger, the leaf shaped blade, the cleaver, the Chris, the Persian, the hawkbill, and the fruit knife or Pical style knife. Let me know if I missed anything, and uh, we will mention it in a for, in a in a um, in a subsequent edition of the Knife Junkie podcast. Uh, I think I'm sort of bound now by honor to do something on the drop point and get into the get into the uh, nooks and crannies of the drop point, like I did with the Bowie and the Tanto and the recurve on on past shows. This has been the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, be sure to check out our other videos. We do close-up videos right here on our YouTube channel where we take close-up looks at knives that come through and come across my desk. I make comparisons. Also, check out uh, Sean Kendrick. The great and powerful Sean Kendrick is our next interview on uh, Sunday, episode number 230. Very interesting guy making some really, I mean, just awesome knives. I think you know who he is. And uh, Thursday Night Knives, tomorrow night, check us out and join us. I want to meet you, not just read your comments. I want to meet you in virtual person. So join us here. So for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I am Bob DeMarco saying, until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24 7 listener line at 724 466 4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the knife junkie podcast